Hello, you're listening to OMG MotoGP Extra, your extra dose of MotoGP with former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Ewan and myself, Amy Reynolds. It's race week again, folks. We've got the circuit of Barcelona, Catalonia coming up, round six of the MotoGP World Championship. And of course, it's our first back-to-back of the season. Next week, we will be in Mugello. Uh, Keith, it's hard to believe, really, that any of the action we saw last time out in Le Mans could be repeated, but it's one of those years. Two of the big ones, isn't it? This one at Catalonia, the next week at Mugello, they are the big ones. For From several points of view, I, I wasn't going to go to it straight away, but we might as well. The rider market, I think, by the time we get to Mugello, all the final details of everything, if they're not already done, will be done this weekend in Barcelona. It's appropriate in as much as it's Dorna's centre. You know, I know they're based up in Madrid or whatever it is for, from from a from an office point of view, but this really is is where all the action goes on for Dorna. A lot of people that live around Barcelona, a lot of, a lot of television crew, a lot of you know riders and 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 team personnel live around the Barcelona area. It is one of the main events of of the year, and by the time we get to Mugello, that rider market, which is on fire at the moment, you can't get any details at all. We're waiting for really the linchpin. I think it's it's Jorge Martin who's the, who's the linchpin, but of course th- th- that's probably going to be unpopular because everyone else is going to be thinking it's Mark Marquez who's the linchpin. Um, but I think there's decisions that Ducati have to make that are going to going to make the difference in the rider market, and that's when it all shifts. Suddenly that log jam will just go, yeah, you know, flood, and we'll all get sorted out. Hopefully it is Mugello. It's going to be a very interesting uh, weekend from a broadcast point of view. That's for sure. Everyone's going to be running around chasing their tail trying to get it sorted. Well, people only really think it's uh, Mark Marquez because of a comment Gigi Delinea made in terms of we're going to look back at the entire career and I guess that would lend itself more to Mark Marquez. But as you said, at the moment, you would argue that Jorge Martin is the man to beat. Well, I don't think it's so much about the man to beat. I think Mark Marquez is going to show us this weekend that, that you know, he's going to be a factor and he's on a year old bike. I mean... I have mixed feelings about year old bikes. I always think that they've already they come with the data from the previous year. You've got you know a fair bit of knowledge and information regarding the the older bike compared with the new one. And every time you go to a track that that you perhaps haven't done that much testing on, the twenty four bike takes a bit more working around to get it to to where it needs to be. Um, so sometimes you've got a bit of an advantage being on an older bike. But I think that the problem that that, that Ducati have is a political one more than anything. It's how the riders gels. If you suddenly jump Mark Marquez into alongside Pecco Bagnaia, how do those two get on you know it is going to be a tough job you know the last thing you need is a wall and a war in the middle of the bloody Ducati factory camp that's for sure um you know if I were Ducati I'd probably I'd definitely move Martin in, onto a, a full-on factory he's on a full-on factory bike anyway he just happens to be at a different team I mean the, the nuance the difference nowadays between an independent team and a, a factory one is down surely to personnel and and the, and, the, and the very, very latest bits and the very, very latest stuff, which sometimes don't even work anyway. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, you get more people and you get the, the top guys that are working on all that data and everything that's behind, whereas an independent team is literally independent and therefore doesn't quite have as much information, perhaps. But it's, it's a tiny amount of difference. I think Jorge Martin, surely alongside Pekka Benaya, that that kind of works for me. Mark Marquez and Grassini, you know, he's got to be on the latest motorbikes next year. I mean, the guy's taken a massive, massive jump, hasn't he? He's, he's chucked all the money in. He's, he's, he's basically not signed for money. He's signed to an independent team that's that's a great team, but uh, but it's an independent team. Um, he's on last year's motorbikes. He's coming back from massive, massive injuries that would have finished anybody else. Um, I mean, I think Mark Marquez is a remarkable individual, remarkable sportsman. Um and he's still going to teach us a few lessons. I've got a feeling about that. There's no doubt about that. Do you think it will be a sticking point for him if he's in a non-factory team, but he's still got a current bike? Do you know what? Like, say, if he ended up in Pramac. I know what you're saying. I know exactly what you're saying. And, I mean, I just don't think so. I mean, I think that you have the other trouble you have with a factory team. The expectation is absolute. You know, the, the, you, Pekka Bagnaia, it, absolutely, he's on the red bike, he's on the full factory team. He is expected to win the world title. Of course, they all want to win the world title. That's, that's probably daft me saying that. But he's in the factory team. That is a massive pressure, massive extra pressure. The Pramac, you mentioned Pramac. What a great team. You know, fun, great 
personnel, you know, like karaoke on a Friday night or whatever it is that, you know, they're just a great, you know, you can't walk past their, their hospitality unit without wanting to be in there. It's like the party that's closed and you want to all be part of it because Pramac is just fantastic. And they've got great PR, their people are all, and they're on it all the time. I mean, if I, if I was a, a factory rider, I'd, I'd, I'd love working for Pramac. I mean, it was, it is the team for me. I wouldn't want the pressure of, of that extra huge load that you have from being in the full factory side of things. When you've got, Domenicali and you've got bloody Gigi in there and you've got everyone else all stood there staring at the monitors with their solid, solid, you know, stony faces. Um, that just makes life harder. Um, you don't enjoy it as much. And I get the feeling that, that Mark Marcus is enjoying his time at Grassini. You know, it's, he, he changed crew chief. He, and the whole thing that he did, I, I didn't even mention that. I talked about all his injuries getting over and the fact he wasn't on a factory bike. But the fact, you know, Santi Hernandez, you know, didn't go with him. You know, that was a massive thing for me to, to have like your brother um, working alongside you for so long and, and and helping you with the achievements you've got, and then suddenly you don't. I know Frankie Carcetti is a is a great crew chief, as we've seen, and a really good guy. Um, you know, I spoke to one of my my old mechanics, Mike Watt, who works with him on suspension and stuff like that through Olin's. Um, remarkable team, really. But it, I think what it is is that he's enjoying himself, and that makes you fast. Is the point I'm trying to ramble through? It's. Uh, if you if you feel if you feel happy where you are, then you'll be fast. Um, and I just believe that Ducati, wherever he ends up, Mark Marquez is going to end up with full factory kit. Hmm. Do you think Ana Bastianini is completely out of the picture then? I mean, it, it's harsh, and he he might you know Digi rescued his MotoGP career at the last minute, didn't he? For with Grassini, as it happens, um, yeah, maybe the same thing can happen with Bastianini. Bastianini finds himself. I mean, looking at this rider market, it, it, you've got Fermin Aldegir, who, who's, who's signed for Ducati as well. I mean, Fermin Aldegir, you know, you've got somebody that's coming up into the into the MotoGP fray. So that, that becomes even harder for Ducati to, to sort their, their deck of cards out uh, for the coming year. I mean, they're spoiled with riches, Ducati, at the moment. Um, the surprise for me was that, that um, Quattararo carried on with Yamaha. I mean, he's decided to take the money and... and Fingers crossed, hope for the best that you can, uh, that uh, Yamaha come up with the, the goods instead of going with somewhere like Aprilia. I mean, which are an emerging company, you know, KTM. They're they're, they're going to make a step by next year. It would be be interesting to see this weekend because uh, Quattroaro has quoted obviously that they made a step in the morn. Uh, the the aero that they were testing in Mugello in in the, in the recent test uh, is a step forward. Um, it's a fast track Catalonia. It's a bit low grip, um, so we're going to see quite how that works out for, for the likes of Yamaha and for the likes of Quattararo. Yamaha have shown that they're not going to be out of the game. I mean, there's speculation, and I speculate it often, that would they go the Suzuki route and chuck the towel in and, 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 and reverse out of MotoGP? I think there were a few people that were thinking that might be the case. Um, but no, they've gone completely the opposite. They've decided to, to go big. Um, go big or go home. It's, it's one of those jobs. Well, that kind of brings me on to something that's been in the news recently before we talk about this weekend's race um it's obviously no secret that honda are having an absolutely torrid season once again and there were some worrying comments from joan mir i think reported on motorsport.com and i think he was asked you know how long can he he wait there until honda make a step and he his direct quote was i have no idea i have no idea how much more my body can take this well, when you're crashing the amount they are to try and achieve lowly positions, I mean that that there's so many effects that has on a rider. You know, demoralisation is is obviously a major factor. And when you're demoralised and you're not enjoying your work, it's the opposite of what I said a moment ago about being in Pramac. You're enjoying your day. You're enjoying working with the people you're working with. You're enjoying riding motorbikes, which basically, at the end of the day, is what we're all about. Um, I feel desperately sorry. You know, former world champion. You know, great rider. He can't stick it to the track any given weekend. He's always going out the road. And when he says, my body can't take... I think we all get a bit anaesthetized to what these guys are going through. I mean, just riding them bloody motorbikes bruises you, let alone falling off them. You know, it's mm. a, they are incredible things to, to to ride. You know, the forces that they're going through, the, the, the way that they have to train. There's been a big thing lately, haven't there, about the diets that these guys are on that, that are, you know, it would be dangerous to most people to, to try and take on some of the, the diet packages that they're working at to try and get their bodies to, to work even better around it. I mean, Christ, things have changed. We had a laugh just before we came on air there about my training regime was a couple of pints and a fag. You know, a cigarette, that is, to anyone that doesn't know. 
Um, yeah, you know, that's how, you know, Barry Sheen. <laughs> he got a hole in the I front of his helmet images. so he could have a drag on a fag before he actually went off and raced. You know, yeah. things are so different and the pressure is so much higher. Joe Amir is, you know, is a great rider. Um, and you just wonder where, where you go. I mean, he will have made reasonable money, you know, in the past. I mean, that at the end of the day, that suddenly starts to come into focus. How much have I made? Where I am? Where am I in this world? What am I? What is my future? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Um, family starts to come into view as well. You start to realise that your age is just beginning to tick over a little bit. Um, all of these things have a real bearing on on how fast you ultimately are on the racetrack. And you know, we've we've heard the Aspargaro brothers. You know, they they're quite vocal over how they feel about things as well. Paul now as a test rider, he's been very good in some of the recent um, comments that he's made. Aleish, we're going to hear more from him, of course. You know, this weekend could be a great week weekend for Aleish. He won everything here last year. Um, you know, will he do it again this year? Well, I don't think so. As you can see, I think it's his teammate that will be doing quite well. well I've been come in on. <laughs> we'll come on to your big uh, reference and hint to this week's predictions in just a moment. Um, Touching back on what you just mentioned, that was actually, I mean, Joanne Mir is such an intelligent guy. He is, like you said, a former world champion. He was so amazing when he was in Moto3, Moto2, but he is really intelligent and he's obviously looked at things and gone, the reality is people that come in here, it's worse off when they leave. Like they leave worse than when they came in. You obviously are no slouch to get a factory Honda ride that position has always come with so much esteem and 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 honor almost that you've been kind of chosen as a factory honda rider yet everybody's fortune when they leave at the moment is pretty dim including mark marquez one of the greatest arguably of all time um would we say honda i mean you'll have more of a back reference than i have but is this Honda's potentially like worst moment in the history of the sport and is there a real risk that they could walk it was interesting this weekend at British Superbikes to see the likes of Takei Okuyama in the garage in in the factory Honda UK garage Honda are in difficult across the board I mean I was at the Northwest 200 they had a, a you know great difficulty with with standard production bikes in the in the super stock class they didn't even take super bikes to the Northwest 200. They were basing their racing, Dean Harrison and, and co, on superstock machinery. And even then, you know, they were having, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, they, they had silly things like, um, you know, a melted oil filler cap that came off that's been a, a problem with production bikes for some time. For some reason, they're still running the plastic ones when they should have been running the aluminium. There's tiny little things that are wrong. I think what's happened is, is focus-wise, Honda are in trouble. Um, I can't imagine Honda chucking the towel in. No, I can't imagine that at all. I think that Honda, the mighty Honda, I mean, can you imagine how bad that would be for our sport if the mighty Honda chucked it in? I think we're in a transition period. We've got new rules coming up in 2027. You know, Honda are going to be working like mad towards getting that right. Unfortunately, the likes of Mir are fodder. You know, they are the, the transition rider. You know, he is the transition rider at the moment. And that bloody hard place to be it really is he's not on a favored motorbike they're not yet making the progress they need to make none of these concessions and stuff that they've got are, are, are coming to the fore at the moment um but they will you know i think i think we're going to see a, a, a change at some stage where yamaha and honda do start to come back you know the japanese were caught out by the european factories making some great great gains but how long did we talk about ducati you know not performing the way they should do and seemingly not listening to what the riders wanted for so long. Um, yeah, and and Gigi particularly was a linchpin there, brought them back on side and the factory start to work to where they are. I can see the same thing for Honda. I can't see them chucking the towel in. I, yeah, yeah, world events are going to more have an effect on our sport than, than anything else. I worry about where, where we are with world events and the financial situation globally. Um how bad is it going to get? I mean, I don't know. It's it's a it's a guess all round. But Suzuki, I think Suzuki were in difficulties on several fronts. I mean, their road bikes weren't really, yeah, you know, the, the the range were not going in the in the direction. They hadn't really moved much for ages, um, and so on. So Suzuki's example is different. I think 
But the mighty Honda, no, I can't. I can't see them pulling out. I feel sorry for Mir. He's in that position at the minute. There's no way Mark Marquez would have jumped ship if he could see forward that Honda were going to make an achievement or, or come back within a year, within two years. Mark Marquez took stock, looked at it, decided, bang, I'm out of here. And I think Mir, what other choices did he have at the time? I mean, you know, he signed for Honda, but that wasn't because that wasn't because of Honda. That was more because of there wasn't much else on the table. You know, nobody really wanted the Honda ride. It was there, and and he'd got a a leap of faith that they might be able to come up with something. Um, they haven't yet. Let's move on to talking about the race this weekend in Barcelona. Uh, Jorge Martin comes in, still leading the championship. He is 38 points ahead of Peco Bagnaia, Marc Marquez and Enea Bastianini, uh, equal on 40 points. I was so surprised by something I read actually in the MotoGP Dorna press release that Peco Bagnaia hasn't actually ever had a GP podium in Barcelona. It's not been a, it's not been a happy hunting ground. No, I mean it's a, it's a, it's an odd place. I, Catalonia, Barcelona, fantastic racetrack. I think great venue. They really make an effort there. It's a it's a big old job. Fan zones and places for the kids and all the rest of it. I mean, last year I went with. Um, funny enough, my wife booked a holiday, and then I, I was moaning because I don't like holidays. And um, and suddenly I looked at them. Uh, what year? What time of the year it was? And oh, look, <laughs> it's the Grand Prix half an hour up the road. But she's um, thrilled. And it is a great area. I mean, Barcelona is a great city anyway. Um, and of course, the beaches all the way along there, right the way through Blanes, all the way down to Barcelona. And you can take your pick. There's a massive great area that you can find hotels and the like. Access is great. You can get in a train, whatever you want to do, into the into the track. I, I mean, I I like going to that racetrack. Bit low grip, um, but it is a proper Grand Prix track. Uh, so, and now they've sorted out the last couple of corners again. So we've got that back. Um, yeah, they ruined it for a minute or two when they had to change turn 10, but they've, they've sorted it out now. The Formula One again, putting bloody chicanes in there. Um, <laughs> shame Harry's not here. I could have a go at him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we got, a, we got a big up Harry in his first Formula One Grand Prix commentary yes, last week. Yes, well. absolutely. If I you wonder where he is, that's what he's been doing. And I'll tell you what, he did a bloody good job. 26 year old. He's he's on the move. It's, it's it's a shame he's not a bit more bikes, but we do like to take the Mickey out of him. But um, but congratulations, Ari. Good job. Well done. Come Absolutely. back. Absolutely. Please do. We miss you. Um, I want to back reference something that you brought up. Obviously, last time or last time out last year, rather, it was a it was a dream weekend. That's not really kind of pitching that too too highly. But for Alicia Spargro, he lives in Grenoyers, which is essentially where the circuit is. It is his backyard circuit. Um, the year before, he made a bit of a mess of a potential win where he misjudged the laps and celebrated too early. And it just was the whole weekend for Aprilia. They had a double podium in the sprint race, a one-two in the main race. It couldn't, it couldn't have gone any better. What do you think his chances are this weekend? Because I feel like even though it's been a slightly quiet start for Aleish, obviously we can see where your preference is going by your T-shirt, Keith. Uh, but even, I feel like his position in Le Mans in terms of Aleish, he was ninth. But I don't think that really reflects actually how good he looked in that race. Now, Le Mans is a different racetrack as well anyway. I mean, it's, a, it's a, Le Mans just chucks up odd results for me. I, I, I think we've always had, have a bit of a surprise. A great event, but... I've never been a great Le Mans track lover, whereas I am when it comes to Catalonia. Not that that counts or anything. It's how everyone else feels about it, of course, because they're riding on it. But I think he had his moment last year. I think Aleish is um, he's going to find it difficult this week because the competition is even stronger, I think. Acosta is going to be there or thereabouts. You're right, it's in his background, backyard. That comes back to what I said a minute ago. It's about the psychological side of things. You know, Aleish feels at home. He feels loved. You know, he, he, the bike worked well at that racetrack. And, you know, again, Vinales was somewhere thereabouts last year. I mean, for me this year, watch out for Oliveira, the track house team. They're, they're due a result. You know, maybe 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 they're going to make it work around there as well. So keep an eye out for track house as a, as a, as a potential um, um, podium. I haven't got them on any of my podiums, but but it would be great for the American team to um, put it together there as well. Um I, I I've got Alish in, in 
in my thoughts, but I've not got him in my top threes this year. Sorry. No, I completely, I, I know exactly where that's coming from. I think I'd probably be falling on the same side. Um, Jorge Martin, though, you know, he's coming off his first double of the season. He is going to be riding the, the wave of confidence. He's obviously also got the whole element of wanting to impress it and really, really make a point for himself being the person in that factory Ducati squad. He's got every every possibility that he could go out and do it again this weekend, surely. He really has. Uh, but I think it's going to be tough. I think, you know, he, he's the man at the moment, Jorge Martin. I think what's happened with Jorge Martin this year compared with he's always been fast, but he seems to have matured into somebody who can win a world title this year. Um, and that's what it's going, to, it's going to be about maturity. There comes a time in your racing life where your raw talent, you know, most of these guys are massively fast always, but your raw talent then meets the maturity of a little bit more age. And somewhere, I always used to say it's between, it's around 28, the age that, that, that kind of that used to be the sweet spot where your talent suddenly met with a brain that could work it all out. And I think that Jorge Martin, this is, this is a year where he's worked it all out. Before you might have had a rush of adrenaline or blood to the head or whatever it might have been and thrown it at the fence. But, you know, I, I just feel that this is this is his year at the moment. Um, but we've got a long way to go, a massively long way to go. And the points lead that he's got, okay, it might be 38 points, but that ain't much when you can you can earn, how many can you earn? 37 points in a weekend. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he, that could be wiped out in one bad weekend if he's if he's unlucky. Same could be said, of course, for everyone else. Um You've got a man well, chasing him as well who knows all about clawing down the deficit. Pekka Bagnaya coming back from a 90 point. You would have never have imagined when you see 90 points on the championship table and you go, well, it's championship done for him. There's, surely there's no way that he's ever going to come back from that. But he's well, already think, proven that he can. No, well, I think that has an effect as well from the point of view that you look at it and you think, oh, shit, <laughs> all I've got to do is go out and race. Um, when you're 90 points behind, it's it's when you're you know, you're defending a small lead in the championship or you're... You know, that's that's when push comes to shove. And I think that that's where Jorge Martin does have the maturity this year to perhaps overcome that extra pressure of, of Christ, they're catching me. You know, you just got to keep... It's funny, when you talk to any of these guys nowadays, they focus on their own job. You ask, a, you know, you will have done as a journalist. You ask a rider, you know, who you keep an eye on? What do you think to the KTM? What do you think to this bike, that bike, and all the rest of it? And they all, they'll all answer pra pra practically the same. I haven't really noticed. I'm, I'm focused on my own game. And that's exactly what it takes nowadays. It's that pinpoint focus on your own performance, your your team's own performance. They're not looking to the sides. They're not they don't it's not that they don't care, but then they're, they're not paying attention to what else is going on in somebody else's backyard. They're, it's only what they're riding and the way that they're riding. So I think the Jorge Martin will be psychologically um stronger this year than he's he's been previously. And just a word also on KTM because it's been a bit of an odd year for them. I think Brad proved last time out in Le Mans that he's still got that capability of coming through when, you know, the odds are against him in terms of his grid position. But they're due a bit of a good weekend. And this could be the one. I mean, I mentioned low grip earlier on. I mean, you know, Brad tends to come good late in the race. He, he you know, so it might be a situation with the KTM where where that'll come good. Yeah. Predictions are going to be fairly difficult, I think, this week, uh, I th well, as they are every bloody week in MotoGP. But I think that that what's going to be interesting for me, I think the main point for me is, is not even the race this week, is, is what's going to happen the week after when we get to Mugello. When it all settles down, the people have done their final signings and we know where they're going. I think Mugello, we're going to start getting that, that yeah, unblocking of, of the, the log jam of, of signings. And I think that will make a difference, again, psychologically to everyone. Once they're locked into where they're going, you know, Quattararo, I know, is locked in. We've, you know, we've got a few that, you know, uh, Bainaya obviously is locked into what he's doing as well next year. But but everyone else seems to be floating around pretty much. Who else is, is pretty much locked in? Fermin Aldeguer, of course, I mentioned him earlier. He's locked into a Ducati ride, yet we don't know where um, because they've, they've got, a you know, what a deluge of riches! I mean, what are they going to do with all the, the, the top guys that they've got signed? Um, unfortunately, Cal Crusher. We should mention Cal Crusher. I, I mean, he was supposed to be riding in Mugello as well. I mean, that that will affect the Yamaha program. He's had a right hand that's been playing him up for a while, and he had an operation that hasn't um, quite worked out as well as he might have hoped, and they will have hoped. That again is going to cause them a problem from a 
from a test schedule point of view, um, when they're you know one of their major inputs is is been taken out of the game for for a while. So uh, Yamaha are still you know they've got so much extra work to do. It'd be interesting for me to see if Quattararo has got anything this weekend with the Yamaha. He said they made a step. Maybe they're going to shock us this weekend again. It's a it's a slightly low grip place. I hope that these we've had strange weather in Europe. You know, uh, it, it's not, it's been cold down there. You know, yeah. it's nowhere near the, the temperature of Barcelona that you would expect at this time of the year. So that's going to make a massive difference as well as to who ends up going, you know, quick. Okay, we've been teasing this one out a bit, Keith, because particularly if you're listening to us rather than watching us, Keith is sporting a very, very uh, big hint as to his top pick this weekend. <laughs> so tell us well, who's on your team shirt. It's a shame I didn't have a T-shirt or two halves because I've got a Costa for winning the sprint, his first first GP win, if you like, on uh, on Saturday. Um, but I've got Vinales for the win on Sunday. Um, I think that the Aprilia is the right bike for the track. I think Maverick is, yeah, due another one. So we'll we'll see. So sprint race Costa, Martin, Mark Marquez, Grand Prix, Vinales, Mark Marquez, Van There you go. Fair. There Nailed to the mast. And we will see if they turn out to be true in a few few days. Um, but I don't think you're far off with those, Keith. Uh, we are, sadly, every single time it's sadly, out of time. Actually, before we go, Keith, we are actually just hearing that there is potentially a retirement announcement coming today in the press conference. We're recording this on Thursday. So this is the day the paddock gathers do all their media duties and, and the big Thursday press conference. Apparently... Alicia Spargro is announcing his retirement. No shock, no surprise. I think that we Paul Spargro, his brother, went to uh, a test role. Alish, I think, is finding himself, you know, eased out. He's the oldest man in the field nowadays. You know, it, it's his home Grand Prix. You've said that already. You've alluded to it already. It would be the right one for him to make that announcement, and that will take the pressure off of him, and he can ride just like he wants to ride for the rest of the year and get his best results before before we come to the end of it all. But, I mean, he's been a valuable participant, you know, over the years, um, but he must be feeling the pressure from behind. There's so many youngsters coming through now, and he's really got nowhere to go. Well, that's us. We are out of time for this week. We'll be back on Monday. Uh, before we close out, a big thank you to our Patreon supporters, Keith Spiel Spielender, I will get that right, uh, Melissa Craig, Anne Height, Scott Casey, Josh Miller, Peter Smith, Paul Stevenson, Eric Fajardo. If you enjoyed listening to today's podcast, please remember to hit the subscribe button wherever you listen to your podcast from. And remember, you can also get in touch with us at OMG MotoGP on social media or even send us a voice note on omgmotogp at gmail.com. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs>